Hello everyone and welcome back to another video with me, Miss Martins. Today we're going to be going over some grade 11 chemistry exam questions and in particular we're going to be focusing on the multiple choice questions. So first of all, before we get into the questions, I wanted to share some multiple choice question tips with you. So my first tip is always answer every single multiple choice question, even if you have to guess. Um, and have to guess is an absolute must. Obviously, we ideally want you guys to try and figure it out or use a educated process of elimination. But why I included that in my tips is because I have recently marked students' papers and I've seen cases where students don't know the answer. And instead of just guessing, they leave it blank. If you have four options, A, B, C, and D, then if you absolutely have no idea, you may as well guess one of the four options because then you have a 25% chance of getting it right. My second tip is, I kind of touched on in my first tip, and it says instead of focusing on which one is correct, eliminate the incorrect ones first. And this is especially true if you have no idea what's going on. Usually out of the four options given, there will be one, sometimes two, that is absolutely incorrect. And that narrows down your choices. And if you have to guess, it makes it makes your chances a lot higher. It increases your odds of guessing the correct one. And my third tip is look at your formula sheets or formulas to help you understand the relationship between variables. Often multiple choice questions are tricky. And in a lot of cases, they ask you to understand the relationship between your variables in a formula. So for example, if you were considering boils gas or something like that, they would ask you to understand or they would check your understanding of your relationship between pressure and volume or in this um, gas equation, PV equals NRT. They could say if I keep these variables constants, for example, number of moles and temperature, and I decrease the volume, what will happen to the pressure? And understanding your formulae and how the relationships relate to your formulae will help you understand how to interpret the multiple choice question. Now in today's video, for these multiple choice questions, we will be covering a wide span of topics, including those listed here on the screen. So let's jump right into the first one. Our first one says the tendency of an atom to attract the bonding pair of electrons is known as. So this is almost a definition multiple choice question and the term that best fits this description. The tendency of an atom to attract the bonding pair of electrons is known as electronegativity. We know that if an atom has a higher electronegativity, it will have a stronger attraction or pull on the bonding pair of electrons, and therefore that atom within that compound will be more electronegative. Okay, our next question says hydrogen bonds and London forces induced dipole forces have a common characteristic in that they. And the description that best fits this question is that they are both intermolecular forces. Now remember hydrogen bonds is the strongest type of intermolecular force that we will consider. London forces or induced dipole induced dipole forces, also known as dispersion forces, are more weaker. They're relatively weaker compared to hydrogen bonds, but they are both intermolecular forces, which means that they exist between molecules. So, for example, if I have a water molecule over here and that water molecule is attracted to another water molecule over here. This dotted line represents my hydrogen bond. This represents an intermolecular force. So intermolecular means between molecules. Okay, so hydrogen bonds and London forces, we know that hydrogen bonds occur between polar molecules and especially or you know, more specifically between molecules where a hydrogen is bonded to either a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. And London or London forces or dispersion forces occur between nonpolar molecules. Um, a is incorrect because we know that intermolecular forces or forces between molecules are definitely not stronger than chemical bonds. Chemical bonds are intramolecular forces. So another word for chemical bonds are intramolecular forces. And those forces, comparatively, are a lot stronger than intermolecular forces. So the most correct option here is D. They are both intermolecular forces. For 1.1, which one of the bonds between the atoms below has the highest polarity? 
So in order for a bond to have a very high polarity, it will have a very high difference in electronegativity. So what you're looking for in order to select the correct option here is the bond that has the highest difference in electronegativity. And the way that we'll answer this question is we'll look at our periodic table and calculate the difference in electronegativity between these two atoms. The easiest way to see which one will have the highest, or highest difference in electronegativity or the highest polarity will be to look at these atoms because they're all bonded to hydrogen. So we know that the electronegativity for hydrogen will be constant across all these options. And we will compare the electronegativities for chlorine, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen and see which of these have the highest electronegativity, therefore causing the greatest difference in electronegativity, and therefore the bond will have the highest polarity. So let's check it out. So we can see out of all the atoms listed, oxygen has the highest electronegativity and therefore with hydrogen that bond will have the greatest difference in electronegativity and therefore the greatest polarity so our answer is c and that is why we can think about the h bonding with a nitrogen an oxygen or fluorine these ones so hydrogen and a nitrogen hydrogen and oxygen hydrogen and a fluorine these will be the most polar bonds and that's why hydrogen bonding exists and it's the strongest type of intermolecular forces because of that high polarity but if we look at hydrogen and nitrogen we can see that hydrogen is 2.1 nitrogen is 3 um, so oxygen still wins in this case so my option is c my next question says solid iodine sublimes easily the intermolecular forces present in iodine are so now you should know that iodine is a diatomic molecule so i2 you should also know that therefore the difference in electronegativity will be zero, creating nonpolar bonds and therefore a nonpolar molecule. And you should know that the forces that exist between a nonpolar molecule and a nonpolar molecule, so between an iodine molecule and an iodine molecule, that intermolecular force is called London forces. So that's the intermolecular forces present. Our next question has a graph that shows how potential energy varies with distance between the nuclei of two nitrogen atoms when a double bond between the nitrogen atoms is formed. So we've got this is the distance between those atoms, between the two nitrogen atoms, and we've got potential energy, and you should know by looking at this diagram that if I read upwards from the lowest point on the graph where the potential energy is at the lowest, this over here, this point over here represents when the molecule is formed. So when the potential energy is at its lowest and we've got a stable compound, that is when my molecule is formed. So that 125, because that's along the x-axis, which is distance between the nuclei, that 125 represents the bond length in picometers. Okay, so immediately option A is out and option D is out because we said bond length must be 125. And then reading this way on the graph, 418, that represents the bond energy because if you read that off, that's along the potential energy axis. So that means it represents the bond energy. That is the energy required to break that double bond, um, to separate those two nitrogen atoms, to break the double bond, and it's the energy released when that bond is formed. So therefore our answer is C. If you wanna see more videos like this one, I have a video on bond energy and bond length. I will link it up above and in the description below. Our next question says the type of bond formed between an H plus ion and H2O is called a dative covalent bond. If you wanna see a video where I go through more of a covalent bond, polar bond versus non-polar bond, molecular shape, data covalent bond, again, just check up above i'll link that video up above and in the description below but this is a data of covalent bond because the h2o has a lone pair of electrons and the h plus ion has an empty valence shell okay so therefore both of those lone pairs on the hydrogen on the oxygen in the water molecule will be shared with the empty h plus ion our next question says the shape of the molecule in which the central atom is surrounded by two lone pairs and two bonding pairs so our general formula looks like this a is the central atom x2 those are the two bonding pairs e2 that's the two lone pairs that 
is basically bent or angular. And an example of this would be water or H2O. Again, my video that is linked in the description below goes through examples like this in more detail um, in the context of a past paper. Then I've got the intermolecular forces in dry ice are. Now, in order to determine what intermolecular forces are present in a compound such as carbon dioxide, we need to consider if carbon dioxide is a polar covalent compound or a nonpolar covalent compound. Now, the bonds between carbon and oxygen, those bonds are polar bonds. However, the molecule itself has a linear shape. And because of its linear shape, it has a symmetrical or an even charge distribution. So that is no net dipole moment. Symmetrical charge distribution, which means the even charge distribution, the charges are balanced. And that means that overall, it is a nonpolar molecule. And you should know that between nonpolar molecules, the intermolecular forces that are present are known as London forces. Now this question may be a little bit tricky, but I'm going to show you how to answer it. It says, which one of the following has the strongest forces between its molecules? In other words, they're asking which one, which one of these have the strongest intermolecular forces. Now, first of all, we should be aware of the fact that all of these are diatomic molecules, which means that all of these will have a difference in electronegativity of zero, okay? Because it's the atom bonded to itself. So the difference in electronegativity will be zero, making it a nonpolar bond, and not only a nonpolar bond, but also a nonpolar molecule. And what do you know about nonpolar molecules? We just mentioned it in the previous question. The forces, the intermolecular forces that exist between nonpolar molecules are London forces. Now, if all of them are nonpolar, have nonpolar bonds and therefore are a nonpolar molecule, and all of them have London forces, how do I know which one has the strongest London forces? Well, now it all comes down to molecular size. So which one is the biggest molecule? And how we figure that out is we look at the mass or the relative atomic mass on the periodic table. So we're dealing with diatomic elements over here. We've got fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Those are all the halogens. And we can see that iodine has the largest atomic mass number, and therefore it will have the largest molecular mass by far. So because iodine has the largest molecular mass or the molecular size, it'll have more London forces, therefore stronger London forces. In a polar covalent bond, okay, so the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is zero. No, that's not true. A is true if we're talking about a non-polar covalent bond. Electrons are shared unequally between two atoms. That seems correct. Let's look at C and D. C, electrons are transferred from the less electronegative to the, no, we do not have a transfer of electrons. That is an ionic bond. And it's generally from a metal to a non-metal, so this is completely wrong. Delocalized electrons are shared between atoms. No, we don't have delocalized electrons that are shared. It is the sharing of electrons unequally. Okay, that is our answer for 1.2. 1.3, the type of intermolecular forces present between N2 molecules. Similarly to iodine earlier, we said the difference in electronegativity for nitrogen will be zero, therefore nonpolar bonds, therefore nonpolar molecules, therefore London forces. The shape of a molecule with four bonding electron pairs and no lone pairs is called, so that would be AX4, that is tetrahedral, okay? So these are def def definitely not four bonding pairs. Linear would be AX2, so two bonding electro electron pairs. Trigonal planar would be AX3, three bonding electron pairs, no lone pairs. So linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, these just have bonding electron pairs, no lone pairs, but trigonal pyramidal just be careful with trigonal pyramidal because that would be a x three and then one bonding pair 
for example, we have the ammonia molecule like that. We know that nitrogen has five valence electrons, so the X's, one, two, three, four, five. Hydrogen each has one, so this represents ammonia. We can see that it has three bonding pairs and one lone pair, so that is AX3E, that is trigonal pyramidal. Tetrahedral is this one, four bonding electron, electron pairs, no lone pairs. 1.2 is an interesting question. It says iodine crystals are added to hexane. They give me the molecular formula for hexane. It basically has six carbons like this, three, four, five, six, and then there's little hydrogens surrounding those carbons, 14 of them. So everywhere where I've drawn a little line, there will be a hydrogen. I'm not going to fill all of them in, but you get the picture. And iodine we know is I, I. So we dissolve that in hexane, so the iodine dissolves, hexane is turned purple. The correct option to describe the molecules is. So they want to know the polarity of the molecules. And off the bat, as discussed earlier, we know iodine is nonpolar because the difference in electronegativity is zero, therefore nonpolar molecule. Um, so we therefore know that our options are either going to be option B or option C. Now, we need to figure out which one hexane is. Now, they say that the iodine dissolves and the hexane is turned purple. The only way iodine will dissolve in hexane is if they have a similar type of intermolecular force. So this follows what we call the solubility rule, which states that like compounds dissolve in like compounds. That means that they must have a comparable strength of intermolecular forces. Okay, similar strength of intermolecular forces. That means that a polar substance will not dissolve in a nonpolar substance and vice versa. But a nonpolar substance like iodine will dissolve in a nonpolar substance like hexane. So your answer is C. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please let me know in the comments below. This was just a very quick overview of some multiple choice questions that you can expect from this section. I have a lot more chemistry exam papers, so check out my playlist. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure to subscribe and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.